Uh, and, and so we'll do some, uh, some very brief remarks up here and then have a discussion. And uh, my name is David Swanson. Uh, one of my hats is directing a new project called World Beyond War. Uh, which some of these other folks have been helping with and been part of. Uh, Alice is on our coordinating committee, or was until recently, I think. Um, and, uh, and I've passed around some cards and sign-up sheets that you can pass around uh, the big sign-up sheet to other people who come in. Uh, that you can sign a pledge that's now been signed by people in about three-quarters of the nations on Earth. And we're really making this a global rather than just a U.S effort to advance the idea and strategies for total abolition of war, um, for moving away from a culture that accepts war to one that works on reducing and eliminating it. Uh, and so we don't, so we cease talking about the next wars uh, as if there simply must be the next wars as every U.S. television program does. Um, so we start acknowledging the existence of the 55 percent of the U.S. federal discretionary budget that is for wars and war preparations. Um, we have this huge debate between liberals and conservatives where one wants to spend more money and the other wants to spend less money and it's entirely about 45 percent of the budget. Uh, everyone from Jeb Bush to Bernie Sanders seemingly oblivious to the other 55% of the budget that doesn't get mentioned. And there's never any conversation about moving money from the bad things to the good things. And the bad things are, of course, much more than the 55% that's for war. You can take your pick of all the other horrible things from uh, prisons on down that are in there. Um, we just, uh, in this town, saw the United States at the behest of Israel prevent uh, progress on nukes and on a weapons of mass destruction free Middle East uh, and we see most of the countries uh, in that region advancing with nuclear energy. Uh, we have uh, a news story that's almost a little blip, almost no attention paid. Uh, anthrax being shipped all around the United States and to South Korea. Um, raise your hand if you know what Plum Island is. What was that? Uh, Raise your hand if you know what Plum Island is. <laughs> Little island off the tip of, I think it's that direction, off the very far tip of Long Island. Um, the tip where they between Connecticut and uh, Suffolk County. Well, Connecticut's not part of Long Island. No, it's but the Long Island Sound, it's in the water, it's not, it's, it's okay. halfway. It's, it's you asked the question, David. Yeah, I'm telling you. Know, you know, the answer, yeah. Yeah, this no. is well, Long Island may have more than one tip, but anyway, it's way the heck out there, and it's a little island where they invent diseases like Lyme disease and so forth that you may have heard of, but you don't know where they came from. Uh, this is, you know, an industry in the United States: biological and chemical weapons that are supposed to be things of the past. Um, and so there's, there's not yet a conversation about eliminating war. And our other three panelists here are going to talk briefly about different aspects of war. And then I'm going to come back and say a few words about the entire machinery of war. But there is a conversation now about, about getting rid of nukes. There's a conversation about getting rid of prisons. I mean, the New York Times seems to have turned against prisons, but, you know, mass incarceration, but not mass murder. Uh, the death penalty, Nebraska just fell. I mean, it's a state every couple months now on the death penalty. But we're not talking about war as something we can get rid of yet. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. I think first we're going to start with the biggest, most dangerous piece of war, which is the nukes. And our expert here, Alice Slater, is, has been part of World Beyond War. She is. Uh, part of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and every other major effort on getting rid of nuclear weapons and is not just the New York expert, but the expert uh, on anti-nuclear activism. So, Alice Slater. Thank you. Unfortunately. Well, I was just in this, thing. I was just in this four week meeting, the Non-Proliferation Treaty in New York at the UN. This is a treaty that the United States signed in 1970. And we promised with Russia, England, China, and France to give up our nuclear weapons 
that all the rest of the countries in the world promise not to get them. Oh, here's our video. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Friendly. You haven't missed much. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Just missed me. You got me. So anyway, uh, so here's this treaty, 1970. Everybody in the world signed it except three countries, India, Pakistan, and Israel, and they went and got their nukes. The treaty had this Bastian bargain to sweeten the pot. If you sign the treaty and promise not to get nuclear weapons, we'll give you the keys to the bomb factory, we'll give you peaceful nuclear weapons. So this is the insanity of the treaty, you know, like uh, this is why we're upset about Iran. You know, any nuclear reactor is a potential bomb factory and produces the weapons material. And then if you just put it through an enrichment machine a couple of times, it's up to bomb grade. So North Korea joined the treaty, got its peaceful nuclear power, walked out, made a bomb. I mean, that's how they got their bomb. So here's this 1970 treaty. It's set to expire in 1995. And they have to come back and review what's been accomplished. And it has a nuclear disarmament promise in it to make good faith efforts for nuclear disarmament. So it's not airtight. And they came back 25 years later, and now they had double the number of nuclear weapons on the planet. And a lot of us showed up at the UN in 95, and they renewed uh, and extended the conference indefinitely. And part of the deal and the arm twisting that went on to get the governments to agree was that because the Arab states, they would hold a conference to look at a nuclear weapons free weapons of mass destruction free zone. There are lots of nuclear weapons free zones. Mexico was the first to do one in Latin America where the countries pledge beyond the NPT that there will be no nuclear weapons in their zone. You know and they've spread around the world, mostly southern hemisphere. It's in the north the, where the Vikings came from, you know, and then the old colonial masters that nobody's nuclear weapons free. Mongolia became a nuclear weapons free zone after it left the Soviet Union. So anyway, here we are. They promised that Middle East conference. They never delivered. They promised five-year reviews. They would come back every five years and hold a four-month, four-week meeting and review progress. And they made promises in 2000 for an unequivocal commitment to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. And then they made promises in 20, uh, well, 2015 they didn't make too many. And then in 2010 they made a whole bunch of new promises. But meanwhile, while they were cutting the size of there are still 16,000 nukes on the planet. 15,000 are in the US and Russia, so it's up to us. We are totally making Russia nuts. We promised Gorbachev when the war came down that we would not expand NATO if they didn't object to a unified East Germany being part of NATO. I mean, they lost 26 million people to the Nazis, so they had a problem with Germany. We have expanded NATO right up to their border. We have put missiles in Poland, Romania, and Turkey. And part of the deal that Kennedy made with Khrushchev to get the weapons out of Cuba, we took our weapons out of Turkey. Well, they're back. And we had this anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia at some point in, in 72. We were building so many missiles, we said, OK, We'll, build, we'll have an agreement that we won't build anti-missile missiles so we can stop building more missiles. Putin offered Clinton, you know, how they were demonizing Putin and, and Hillary's calling him Hitler, so it's like Hitler. He offered Clinton to cut our arsenals to 1,000 nukes each. I mean, we each had at that time 9,000. And then we could have called everybody at the table and negotiated nuclear disarmament. But he asked him, don't put your missiles in Poland, and Turkey, and uh, Clinton said, no deal. Bush walked out of the treaty. They, he just abrogated the anti-ballistic missile treaty. It doesn't exist anymore. So that's where we are, not to mention the pivot to Asia, which you're probably reading about, that's getting China crazy. They're putting a new base in Australia. They're putting missiles in Japan and asking them to get rid of Article 9 of their constitution 
their peace constitution where they promised not to ever make war. We made them do that after World War II, so now we're, we're lobbying them to get rid of that provision so they can be our fellow warriors. And they, anyway, here's the good news. We come to this four-week meeting, and over the last two years, the Red Cross made this fabulous statement two years ago that of the catastrophic consequences of the nuclear war. It's so inhumane that we can't possibly help people with it. It'd be a nuclear war. And governments picked it up. Norway had a meeting, then Mexico, and Vienna had a meeting in December with civil society. There's this vibrant new campaign, ICANN, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And they're calling for a ban on nuclear weapons because that MPT says good faith efforts, you know. It went to the World Court, the court ducked. They, they interpreted the MPT to mean there's a, an obligation to conclude negotiations to eliminate nuclear weapons, but we can't say if they're illegal in the, in the very position where the survival of a nation is at stake, we're not going to rule whether they're illegal at that time. Now, the Pope just gave us a huge gift because the Catholic Church has supported this deterrence. You know, they're immoral, but if you need them for self-defense, it's okay. Pope Francis just said, no, they're never okay That's in any instance. So this, this is going to help unpack it. And at this MPT where the thing broke up in disaster and they couldn't agree on a final statement and you know, after four weeks of negotiating where we were getting in all this language and at the Austria meeting in December, Austria made a pledge to fill the legal gap for nuclear disarmament, which means get a ban treaty, like we did for chemical and biologic, say they're illegal, they're prohibited. So, they were negotiating the final consensus document and the U.S. and England and the other, you know, nuclear states, they were all weakening the language and loosening it, but it finally, at the end, our Secretary of State countrymen flew to Israel the last week of the meeting and came back empty-handed, couldn't get them to agree to a date certain on this Middle East conference, and so, we, they delayed the end of it, and we all came in. It was like 10 o'clock at night, and the chair of the conference on Friday, 10 o'clock at night, said she called and up stands the United States and says, we can't agree to this. We're being manipulated by Egypt, you know, and this Middle East, they wouldn't agree to our language. And then England backed them up in Canada. <laughs> South Africa was brilliant. If you just Google South African speech at the MPT, they talked about the inequality, the colonialism of nuclear war. They've always been, everybody's been going along. Everybody, they're out for blood. And 107 countries signed the Austrian pledge by the end of the MPT. We were lobbying all the missions and getting them to sign. So there's going to be a 70th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki this summer. And then there's going to be some country that's going to step up and start an international negotiation to ban the bomb. And this is where our country is not going to do it, but the non-nuclear weapon states. And this is going to have a great effect on what we call the weasel states, like Japan and Australia and Holland and, uh, you know, NATO. They're all in our nuclear umbrella. They don't have nuclear weapons, you know. They're they're holier than now, but they depend on our nuclear umbrella. And when this illegality is out there and, and moving and has momentum, which it's really starting, this is a great moment in history, those countries are going to have to let go of the U.S. alliance. They're going to get pressure from their people, just like with the landmines. You know, we never signed the landmines. They just, you know, but now we still don't use them, like we're afraid to use them. Anyway. Go on, but, <laughs> but, but the other monster is this nuclear. I just have to tell you one more thing. Now that we're making this wonderful deal with Iran that we're not going to bomb the crap out of them, we are selling nuclear power to Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and uh, what's the other one? United, United Arab, Arab Emirates. This is like so to keep them in the nuclear club that they can play with the big boys and have their bomb in the basement. And they'll let us not bomb Iran because you know there's that Sunni Shiite. Anyway, that's 
And we want to shut that Indian point. We have a resolution in New York to do it. So we, will have, we will have lots of time for questions and discussions and rants, and uh, we will go first to Nick Mater, and we have a third speaker who's coming back momentarily, who's multitasking uh, multiple panels. Um, but Nick Mater has been really one of our leaders in pushing to stop this mass murder by flying robots uh, that we call drone missile strikes uh, and has been educating the public and moving the localities and states and taking the message to the drone pilots uh, who are committing the mass murder and, and who see it as murder in, in ways that users of other weapons don't um, and he's got a, a group and a website called No Drones, K-N-O-W, No Drones, and I believe a, uh, a model drone somewhere in this building flying around. It was, it was out front. Uh, out front, okay. Nick Modern. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks uh, everyone for coming. Uh, this, uh, these subjects, I think, are, are very uh, difficult, um, and so, so much so that um, uh, many, many people just totally ignore them, try to work around the edges of, you know, the, the monster in the, in the living room that is continually eating the family. And uh, I, I uh, wanted to just start out by reading a quote from uh, Albert Speer, and uh, S-P-E-E-R. He was um, in World War II the head of the Nazi military industrial, uh, that's not a, a complex in the sense that we know it here, um, but it did involve many uh, private companies. And I would argue that possibly it was the most successful, innovative within this period of time that it existed, effective uh, military construction, invention, research, and application machine that's ever been created. And uh, he was uh, found guilty at uh, Nuremberg um, for a variety of reasons. Some people argue bad reasons, but he was not executed. And he spent uh, many years in jail. Uh, and he wrote a book called Inside the Third Reich. And I think it's a very, uh, it's a long book, but it's very revealing uh, about the mentality that he had and that other people had in pursuing uh, what they viewed as a huge technological industrial challenge uh, to, to continually advance weaponry uh, and put it into use of, you know, as quickly as possible. So at the end of his, his book, he says, the catastrophe of this war, I wrote in my cell in 1947, has proved the sensitivity of the system of modern civilization evolved over the course of century. The sensitivity of the modern civilization. And then he says, now we know that we do not live in an earthquake-proof structure. The buildup of negative impulses, each reinforcing the other, can inexorably shake to pieces the complicated apparatus of the modern world. There is no halting this process by will alone. The danger is and this has to do with drones, obviously. The danger is that the automation of progress will depersonalize man further and withdraw more and more of his self-responsibility. And uh, that to me would be, uh, if you had to say, a perfect definition of the development of drone warfare would be one of the, act, act, not as a byproduct, self-responsibility being uh, ignored, but actually as an intention and a political argument for the use of, of, these, of these things. Now, I think it's important also to put uh, drones within a, a larger context of struggle over control of critical uh, resources. What would that mean? Water, uh, farmland going forward, uh, obviously minerals 
in oil. And so we have to see this in relation to the United States military, a military that can no longer field hundreds of thousands of troops, not only because there's no draft, but because the wars that we engage in now are long-term wars of occupation, repression, and execution. This is very hard for people in this country to uh, imagine and experience, uh, in spite of what is being you know, shown of little bits of this. And so um, we have here a confusion around something like ISIS as to what is, the, what is going on there. Is, and my analysis would be, is the latest devil that justifies our continued military insertion into areas where we know we will desperately need resources. Now, President Obama said the other day something to the effect that we have to be worried about climate change because it's adversely affecting our military bases, <laughs> our, our capacity to militarily defend ourselves, and so we must necessarily <laughs> devote our concerns and money to worrying about climate change. Now, one could say, well, he understands the, the American mentality, and so you have to make this argument if you're going to get money for uh, windmills. But, but what we do have is a situation where the Pentagon is going forward with great vigor to plan to insert U.S. military force wherever necessary under a situation of dwindling land, dwindling resources, rising water to protect the economic corporate interests of the United States. So the, the, the overall scheme is not any different. It's a question of can we send humans there or will we now send robots to do our spying and our killing for us. So the, the, the drone that I had out front, a Reaper drone, um, is a primitive drone. Uh, it, uh, it has very, I'd say, very simple kinds of uh, software and, and hardware in it. Uh, what's being worked on now uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, at Johns Hopkins, um, at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, uh, and probably other places too, are those drones that will be able to be fed in images or instructions uh, images of, of people, let's say that uh, they want to kill Joe Friendly, and he's got a very, very, very distinctive face, easily recognized uh, by a computer. So his, his image would be fed into that computer and the drone would fly in his neighborhood, and when it sees him, it would automatically kill him. These weapons are being made to operate in coordination with land robots and sea robots that can speak with each other, that can be given a target. There's something called swarming that's being investigated specifically at Johns Hopkins where the, the robotic weapons will act as a, a swarm of bees where they will be given information about the target and then relentlessly do their surveillance and their attack until that is destroyed. So the U.S. And, and, and Israel are in the vanguard of this kind of research that other countries will necessarily want to buy and or have to protect themselves. So we have this scientific scenario, science fiction kind of scenario that's being already in place and can be viewed happening now in Yemen, Afghanistan, Somalia, parts of Africa, um, and even uh, drone attacks have been conducted in uh, the Philippines, drone surveillance over Malaysia. If you look at the, is what is the structure for this, in the United States, there are drone control bases near at least 15 major communities in the United States, and more may be being developed. At one time, a year and a half ago, it was said, well, our drone attacks are decreasing in Pakistan. 
why are all these drone bases being uh, established at Air National Guard bases? Because the larger plan is to have a global network that will control these robotic machines. We see in Rammstein there is this satellite relay station that just got a lot of attention. We also know that there's a similar kind of relay station in, uh, in Sicily. Uh, and I read something from Bruce Gagnon from the Global Network saying that uh, the people in, in Sicily say that the United States was in league with the Mafia in Sicily in order to get the approvals for establishing the, the space. We see a similar base being established in Australia. And, and uh, so we can see that this is not an, a response to terrorism that's going to go away. It's something that is very well thought out and very thoroughgoing, much the same way that the nuclear system is well thought out, thoroughgoing, and advancing. So there's a group of us who have been trying to do education and seek an international ban, not only against automatic drones, but against the drones we have right now that are killing people right now, because they are in the vanguard and they are actually murdering people. So why not stop all weaponized drones and, and have over with it? Now, I just want to uh, conclude, and I, and I want people to speak to me about this afterwards, to say, well, you're, you're right, or I disagree with this, or this, or this. But in looking over this conference uh, of, the, of the left forum, uh, and looking through the panels, uh, and looking at the, at the slogan for the conference, I do not sense an urgency about stopping this killing nor do I sense an urgency about how this fits in to the destruction of our planet in terms of climate and environment. We have a system where the military is not only a huge consumer of energy and, and pollution and, and, you know, and global warming, if you want to say that. It is also being used and will be used to further mine the earth, to further bring up the oil, to further advanced material culture in a way that is totally destructive to our environment. Now, if we look into history, we see a history of U.S. plantation system that has been a model for the corporate development, and the corporate development and the plantation system all depend for its existence, its structure, on violence on the willingness to kill those people who challenge that system. It's not unlike other governmental systems, but it is part of our history and part of a corporate view of how to protect and advance itself. And my opinion is that you cannot have any kind of saving of the world, any redistribution of power, as long as we have this military application consistent, justified. Now, having said that, I will say to you that I believe that the vast majority of people at this conference believe in just war. They are not pacifists. You can ask people, and this could be brought up, but I, what David Swanson is talking about, I would say most people view that's a good thing in the sweet by and by. But right now we're concerned about our wages, we're concerned about our freedoms, we're concerned about this, is, you know, black lives matter. The black lives do matter, but the same premise that's being used to kill black people, no accountability, you know, secrecy or whatever, is being applied in other places. And so, but people are afraid, so they say, kill the ones over here, save the ones over, over there. I would say that the slogan for the conference should not be no justice, no peace. It should be no peace, no earth. <laughs> because if you're in the middle of a building that's burning down, you're really not going to discuss just the $15 wage. You're not going to have a smorgasbord of political feasting that make you might feel good about your, your subject when the house is burning down. Now, the house is burning down, 
And, and, but we are all sucked into a culture that chooses to look the other way because the burning of the house scares the hell out of people. But our job <laughs> isn't to just say, I'm scared. It's to try to see through this and say, how do we stop the killing that is really enabling this all to happen? You've got a drunken uncle in the house who's going around stabbing people. Are you going to just let him run? No, I don't think so. So, you know, tell me what you think. Thank you. I'm going to speak to that topic, and I'm going to say less than I was going to because I agree with everything that Nick just said. I can hardly say it better, but we have a we have a fourth panelist who was going to be third, but is now going to be fourth because she's not here yet. Uh, and then we're going to get to a, an open discussion. But uh, I, I think that Nick makes a key point that we have a movement on the left of environmentalism, of civil liberties, of economic justice, of racial justice. Uh, that sort of pretends that our biggest public project, the thing we do as a society, that, that, that I use the word we, we don't participate in it, but the United States as a whole makes war. That's what it does. Uh, it, it, it spends about as much as the rest of the world put together. Uh, it spends over a trillion dollars a year on war preparations. The war preparations, the base military budget, the routine military job creation spending, is ten times the spending on any war. So when people add up, you know, what the wars cost and how many schools you could have had, you know, it's it's a drop in the bucket on what's being spent on militarism by the United States. Just going back to 2001 levels of military spending, Bernie Sanders was recently asked or accused. I hear you once said you would cut the military by 50 percent, and he said, Hell no! I never said such a thought. Am I a commie pinko? He should have said. Damn right, that would just get us back to 2001. We would, it would still be overwhelmingly the most, the biggest military on earth. No, no other country would come anywhere close. It would be absurd, unconscionable levels of military spending, but it would be half what is spent now. Uh, but he didn't say that. Uh, and, and of course, the United States is not just overwhelmingly the leading spender on militarism. It is the leading supplier of the weapons that other countries spend on militarism. And uh, a woman by the name of Hillary Clinton recently <laughs> ran a State Department that approved the sale of weapons to dozens of nations, vicious, nasty nations, not that this one isn't, that were giving money to her and her husband's foundations. Uh, and this level of corruption is sort of a you know, a drop in the bucket compared to, you know, Bernie once wanted to legalize <coughs> hitchhiking or whatever it is we're supposed to be uh, furious about. This is, this is the culture of the United States in which the discussion is framed. I mean, I get invited on TV and radio interviews where you have to take one of these two positions or you don't get on the interview, which I end up not getting on. It, you know, this type of war or that type of war, air war or ground war, war with local dark-skinned troops or U.S. troops, you know, and, and these are the choices. No one else in the world, you go listen to the news media in any other country, they don't talk about, here's a new problem, when should we bomb it, or should we do nothing, as if those are the two choices, and there are no other choices. And so we started this project called World Beyond War to make an argument for abolition of war culture, abolition of militarism, abolition of war preparation, total, not immediate, but total and swift abolition of war, and trying to address, and if you go to worldbeyondwar.org, we try to address all of the arguments. Uh, so, no, we need it for protection. No, it endangers us. It makes us less safe. I mean, we have the documentation, we have a list of quotations from current and typically just retired uh, officials and generals telling us we know it's counterproductive, we know it's making us less safe. Recently exposed documents about the plans for uh, the current operation against ISIS, which is so absurdly called uh, Operation uh, Inherent Resolve, an operation which Congress can't bring itself to take a position on. Uh, and, and they don't want us to laugh at this stuff, but they were, they're, they're planning it knowing that you know, they're planning the, the, the feeding of arms and, and trainers to, to Syria, knowing that it's going to create the situation that they are now in. 
ISIS makes a, you know, an hour-long movie asking to be attacked, and they oblige. And the recruitment soar is that, you know, it's replaced Abu Ghraib as the top recruitment tool, uh, the, the U.S. bombing of this organization, where we make the environmental case. Environmental organizations in this country refuse to go after the number one destroyer of the environment. You know, little bits and pieces here and there don't take over this island to bomb it for, for naval, you know, weapons testing and so forth. But military spending, you know, the, the U.S. military would be number 30-something in a list of countries in petroleum consumption. If you took that out, the United States would still be number one. They'd know nobody close, but it would be much, much lower than anything else you could take out. It is far and away. You know, the wars, the Middle East wars were begun for the, the fuel for the British Navy. The British Navy wasn't created in order to attack the Middle East for the fuels, for other things. You know, the, the hu a huge percentage of the fossil fuels that the wars are fought over are consumed in the fighting of the wars. Uh, nothing strips away our civil liberties like the wars for freedom. And the civil liberties groups will not touch it. They will go after the right. symptoms, the torture, the lawless detention and imprisonment, mm -hmm. the assassinations. But only the assassinations if they're not in war, and we can't be sure if a drone murder is in a war or not, because they wrote it down in a secret memo they won't show us, and that counts as a law now, because we're obliged to ignore every law that bans war, because we deal in war studies and the laws of war. There, there was a study came out uh, last week, a bunch of Harvard lawyers went and interviewed like 60, 70 people in four countries uh, that have been involved in, in wars going back to Bosnia, Palestine, Libya, and Somalia. And th these were, you know, so-called civilians trying to ask them, trying to distinguish what's a civilian, what's a combatant, because nobody has a clue anymore. The United States government considers military-aged males combatants, dead bodies combatants. Well, they, they tried to distinct, so they asked these civilians who takes part in wars. And they want everybody. Either you're forced to, or you have very little choice, or you do it to protect your family, or to, for prestige and self-respect, or to make money, or because you're outraged at killing of innocent protesters, and so forth. And they, and they just, they could not find any way to distinguish a civilian from a combatant. Just as there's no way to tell what's proportionate, or what's justified, all these so-called laws of war. Uh, and, and then they announce, you know, at the end of these studies, there's always recommendations, right? We have no recommendations. We have no desire to influence the debate whatsoever. We are just providing evidence that there is no way in hell you can tell a combatant from a civilian. Right. Why do they have no recommendations? Because they must either now be obliged to kill everybody or kill nobody. You've got to choose now. Either it is okay to murder anyone on Earth, like the White House says, like the gentleman says that Amanda's going to tell us about, or you cannot murder anybody anybody, because the people fighting back in defense of their country can't be murdered any more than the people staying out of it. Uh, and, and, you know, so once you get to the point where people providing food and medicine to the people fighting back in defense of their country are combatants worthy of being murdered when they get home to their family, along with their family, and the missile doesn't distinguish, uh, you know, you're not dealing with law anymore. You're dealing with war, pure and simple. Uh, and, and, and so we go through each of these arguments, right? The economic argument, the idea that I, I heard earlier in today's panel that we will desperately need those resources. Well, it's not we, and there is no need, and those are not resources. Those are, those are destructive poison uh, that do not benefit our lifestyle. Uh, and, and incidentally, not a single one of these civilians interviewed had a motivation of wanting to destroy Americans' lifestyle. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So, so the, our, our economy, in fact, is destroyed by militarism, is eroded by militarism. It makes us less prosperous, less secure. Uh, the United States is down in the 30s and 40s in every measure among, uh, among the nations of the world in good economy and job security and job opportunity and so forth. Uh, it's ruining the U.S. economy. Look at the third world infrastructure of this city. Uh, and, and think about the money that you, you go back to 2001 levels of military spending, uh, you got $220 billion to throw around. 
you create high-speed trains across this country, solar and wind across this country, you eliminate global starvation and hunger and unclean water, you provide, you, you triple, quadruple U.S. foreign aid, and, and you got, you know, tens of billions with it to figure out what to do with. Uh, I mean, it's that level of spending. Um, and and, and it, is, it is killing more people by how that money's not spent than by how it is spent, mm -hmm. right? Because it could be saving so many lives. It is, it is the most immoral thing we do. Uh, so what do you replace it with? So I, I won't go into the details because I want to get to a discussion here, but we produced uh, as a team of, of a lot of experts at World Beyond More this book uh, that I have for sale that is a proposal for what do you do instead of war. Everybody wants to know what do you do instead of murder ISIS. And, and, and so it, it's a discussion of nonviolent structures and systems of law and economics and, uh, and diplomacy. That, that should be running the world in, in years to come. Um, we are, uh, uh, I passed around flyers from another group I worked for, Roots Action. I'll just mention briefly that my colleagues are on their way to, to Germany, among other places, where they're going to present a huge German-American petition uh, to the German government demanding that Germany no longer take part in mass surveillance and drone murders at Rammstein and elsewhere uh, with the United States. Um, and if you go to standupfortruth.org, you will see that next week uh, there are these open conference calls and webcasts you can join in with all of these well-known whistleblowers and defenders of whistleblowers and discussions of what we can do to continue supporting uh, and encouraging whistleblowers without whom we would know nothing about what our government does. Uh, a, uh, an event in Germany that will be on John Foster Dulles Street, by the way, and I can really talk about what that means and what, what who Eisenhower's drones were. Um, we, uh, so I, I want to introduce our next speaker, and then we're going to have a, a discussion. And I and I want to let you know there's an event immediately following this one in this same room with some great speakers, including William Bloom, who is one of our great. Uh, chroniclers of U.S. invasions, starting with those ones that the Dulles brothers were involved with and who has joined us in the front row over here. So thanks for being here. Um, and, uh, Amanda uh, Bass is our next speaker, and I, I won't tell you the evil things that this gentleman has done that she has been challenging at New York University, but just to say that this vicious cycle that Nick described of a war culture feeding on itself is well underway, and one of the things that happens when you hold no one accountable for the crime of war and the little crimes that make up war, uh, it, it's not only that they go out and make tons of money and come back into the government and maintain respect and go on book tours, but they become professors and they teach ethics and morality and law <laughs> to young people in this city and across this country, uh, except when some of those young people stand up to them. So, welcome Amanda. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I just want to thank David for inviting me to speak on this panel, and I'm so sorry that I had to step out, um, but I'm very happy to be joining you all today. And just wanted to share a bit with you all about an effort uh, that a few of the students and I, um, as well as my partner who is sitting back there, who has been very supportive of this effort as well, helped to initiate at NYU Law School um, this semester to condemn the law school's decision to hire Harold Coe to teach international human rights law. Um, so for the a human rights law. Yeah. Um, so earlier this year, as I mentioned, the law the law school appointed Harold Coe as a distinguished scholar in residence. That's a quote um, to teach human rights law. Um, and as someone familiar with the U.S. government's targeted killing program, as well as with Harold Coe's very public role in shaping and defending uh, the legality of U.S. targeted killings during his time as State Department legal advisor between 2009 and 2013, um, this news disturbed me. Um, and so a few students and I uh, got together and we authored a statement of no confidence in Harold Coe. Um, and in that statement, we not only condemned the law school's decision to hire Harold Coe to teach human rights, 
Uh, but we also documented Harold Coe's role in shaping and defending the legality of U.S. targeted killings. We cited to Harold Coe's public speeches, including a speech that he gave in March 2010 before the American Society of International Law, where he provided for the first time the Obama administration's legal rationale for uh, targeted killings. We also cited to human rights reports, uh, including reports offered by NYU law faculty uh, who had served in an official capacity at the UN and who had reported on the US drone program's immorality and illegality, as well as to human rights reports authored by uh, students uh, at NYU law school and Stanford clinics which documented um, the devastating human cost of drone strikes in Pakistan. And that report is called Living Under Drones. It's also something we cited in the petition. So we circulated the petition within the law school um, as well as outside of the law school. Uh, we invited students and faculty within the law school to sign on in support. Um, and we also circulated the petition among activists, community groups, anti-war groups um, from around the country and around the world, really. Um, at the same time, we also began to plan uh, a roundtable discussion on drones where we sought to examine the role of human rights lawyers like Harold Coe, who uh, during their time in government helped to mask and to enable crimes on behalf of the U.S. government and who often do so through the rhetoric and through the framework of human rights. So shortly after we circulated the petition, the repression from NYU law faculty and administrators began. The petition organizers, myself included, um, as well as every law student signatory of the petition, which was public, received a personal emails from Professor Ryan Goodman who not only dismissed our um, claims about Harold Coe's involvement in the drone program, but who went on to defend his, his other aspects of his human rights record and to urge students to withdraw their support. A similar letter came out shortly after that from Michael Posner, um, who also urged students to withdraw their support. The NYU Law School Dean, Trevor Morrison, also held his, his law students, his constitutional law students, for five minutes after their class to essentially condemn the petition as a, quote, baseless smear campaign uh, that was wholly inaccurate, that was a departure from NYU Law's uh, reputation as being a sort of fact-based community. And yet, he addressed none of the substantive claims that we were raising, nor took seriously any of the sources to which we cited to substantiate our, our claims. I also received several phone calls, one of them as late as 11 o'clock at night, from Stephen Bright, who is the executive director of the Southern Center for Human Rights, uh, a Yale law professor, and uh, his organization was one for which I interned last summer. And he urged me to, to drop this effort he condemned my involvement in organizing this petition, um, and he asked whether or not I had better things to do with my time. And then finally, uh, one of the student organizers was told, um, was applying for an, uh, for an internship with Human Rights First, which is an organization that Michael Posner founded, um, that he wasn't eligible for an internship there because they had seen his name on the petition they were an organization that held Harold Coe in high esteem and that they would not be able to offer him a position. And then finally, in a meeting with the law school dean, I and two other organizers were accused of, of spewing vitriol unseen in the law school, that is a quote, and of inflicting wounds that will not heal. This is because of our petition and the public letters that we had written uh, addressing the intimidation that students and we ourselves were facing. So in seeking to understand this highly aggressive and belligerent response from some members of the NYU law faculty and the administration, it occurred to us that Harold Coe's defenders were people who had themselves, prior to joining the academy, worked uh, on behalf of the U.S. government and in that capacity 
played uh, roles in perpetuating and defending our government's crimes. So for instance, who is Trevor Morrison? <coughs> Trevor Morrison, by his own admission, worked on, quote, reforming rather than working to abolish military commissions during his time as associate counsel to President Obama in 2009. He has also defended the bombing of Libya in 2011, as did Harold Coe, um, who actually provided the legal rationale for why uh, the US bombing of Libya did not constitute hostilities, and therefore the bombing could <coughs> continue without violating the War Powers Resolution. And then Michael Posner worked for the State Department as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. During this time, Mr. Posner, as well as Mr. Coe, who was State Department legal advisor at the time, expressed no support whatsoever for Haiti's prosecution of Duvalier for crimes against humanity. And this is despite the State Department's well-documented, noxious, and extensive interference into Haiti's internal affairs uh, on numerous other occasions and on other matters. Yet, in this most pressing human rights matter, they opted to remain silent. According to WikiLeaks cables published by The Nation and other newspapers, the US State Department during both Michael Posner's and Harold Coe's time there aggressively blocked a minimum wage increase in Haiti between 2009 and 2014. Their participation in this effort needs to be investigated, but it's clear at least that they, that neither of them either spoke about this uh, as inconsistent with human rights and neither of them resigned from the State Department despite the many criminal actions like these that it undertook during their time there. So in light of all of this, it occurred to us that those in government who, like Harold Coe, defend drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen, or Somalia, who, like Harold Coe or Trevor Morrison, justify wars, whether in Libya or in Iraq, who block minimum wage increases for Haitian workers, or who at least don't speak out about it, who sanction our government's extrajudicial killing of US citizens without due process of law, notice and a hearing, which are just basic constitutional guarantees, um, and who aggressively attack whistleblowers and government transparency activists like Julian Assange, expect to waltz comfortably through the revolving door from government into the academy and demand not only silence around these crimes, but who also uh, demand adulation. We were told we should be honored to have Harold Coe teaching human rights, that we had so much to learn from him, um, that he was a model human rights lawyer, an international law icon, we were told. Um, so this is the phenomenon that we sought to unmask and that we sought to raise our voices against. Those who condemned our efforts told us that Harold Coe was a fighter for human rights from within, someone who made the US government's actions, and in particular its approach to targeted killings, more human rights respecting. We were told that it was better to have him in the office of the State Department legal advisor than someone else who arguably could have done something worse. So for us, the response to this was fairly simple. Um, for us, by focusing the debate about the morality and the legality of Harold Coe's actions in government on whether or not they were worse than what someone else would have done, I think prevents us from imagining different models for government and human rights lawyering, models where rather than trying to uh, put a human rights face on targeted killings, someone who is decent and who cares about constitutional rights, about human rights, and about human life, actually resigns. Um, rather than, as Harold Coe <coughs> did, and as many other government lawyers do, operate as functionaries on behalf of a highly belligerent and criminal state. Pauline Smith. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
you mentioned all the groups and individuals who were opposed to what you were doing. Mm -hmm. How about people who were advocates for you? And mm -hmm. any, any with big names or any others that were to help you and to support what you wanted to do? Yeah. Yeah, there were many. So at this point, we have about 400 people who have signed on to um, the petition that we authored. And Salso actually reached out to a number of individuals, including David, who invited us to speak on his radio show, and he was very supportive. A lot of our support came from outside of the law school. Uh, unfortunately, not a single NYU law faculty uh, supported us, not wow. one. We had faculty from um, the NYU graduate schools, like the history department, the sociology department, political science, who, who signed on and who supported us, but no one from within the law school, but a number of, of scholars and individuals from across the country did. Um, so Medea Benjamin is one person who signed on um, and who also helped circulate the petition. Um, David and others, um, a number, a number of people. Robin Kelly from UCLA. Uh, who else? Is also. Colleen. Colleen Rowley. Yeah. Was a big yeah. Support. She, she was a whistleblower. Was yeah. on the trip to Germany I mentioned earlier. Oh, wonderful. How about Marjorie Cohn, who's in the next room? And Marjorie Cohn, yeah. Yep. What an incredible list of lawyers on the other side. Oh my goodness. I mean, the whole liberal law profession coming down on these students. Seven hundred names. And people, you know, big names, people who, yeah, were just supposedly civil liberties advocates as well. It's very disappointing. It's going. Oh, but can, do you have a quick follow up? Or? Do, do you think it's just fear or uh, is it um, lack of really connecting the dots about life, you know? Fear for why people were coming out to repress. Right, fear of, of coming out and, and speaking your mind on something. I mean, you know, you, you think these are, the, these are the intellectuals, and these are the schools that are, you know, creating weapons and, and drones and everything. It's a pretty sad state of affairs when, when uh, and I'm just wondering what's, what's operating. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that, so this whole experience, I think, really highlighted the really very nasty ugly side to the, the, the law profession and also to elite liberal lawyering and the way that you have this sort of class of elite liberal lawyers who, you know, essentially will defend one another and who essentially, you know, for instance, Harold Coe, um, Trevor Morrison, Posner, these are all people who um, went into government, committed, you know, justified um, a variety of crimes, then come back into academia and take comfortable positions teaching human rights or constitutional law. And I think that it's a way in which they shield one another from accountability. I think they didn't want us to even have the conversation because our critique against Harold Coe could also be leveled against Morrison for similar conduct, against Posner for similar conduct. So I think, you know, it's sort of a way to shut down any sort of um, any sort of critique of their actions to bring about any sort of accountability. Um, I also think the law school is just particularly noxious because there were professors within other departments who had, you know, the sort of awareness that you're describing, who were like, this is basic, right? I mean, this is fundamental. This is, this shouldn't be happening. And yet within the law school, um, you know, it was something that the, you know, that, that a number of faculty and administrators didn't even want uh, Discussed. So. You know, Harold Coe had noticeably better views on laws and war abuses when the president was named George W. Bush, and when uh, you know. But but if you if you criticize not just the Republican legal community or the Democrat, but both of them, uh, well, that's not a good career move. You know, which school is going to hire you when you criticize the crimes of both? And now when. Jeb Bush or some other Republican is president. Harold Coe might try to have a little bit better views, but you, you can't. You, you can't. It's going to be, you know, it's not going to be all the way back to where you were because you, you end up looking like you're contradicting yourself. So it, the, the vicious cycle keeps moving us along. Let, let's go back in the back and then up here. Um, have you come across anything that the drones have been targeting? Citizens, persons in the United States in any tech 
states or territories of the United States? I think, uh, I, I'll, I'll comment and then I'll ask you a question. Um, the FBI has acknowledged that it does have drones that it uses. And the FBI director did uh, acknowledge that about a year ago. Um, it's not clear uh, what kind of surveillance goes on with the drones used by the Border Patrol along the, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious that when, they, when these agencies use these drones, they are using them to follow individuals. Now, the question is, are people being then assassinated? And that's something we also don't know. We, we don't believe that there are weaponized drones flying in the United States. But, but we do believe that surveillance drones are being well, used on a regular this, basis. The, 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 the report, some reporters have published in the New York Times this, have it, quote, their stories about surveillance drones. Right. And we also know commercially drones are all around making deliveries. So yes. that's another list of, well, I mean, if you buy something and it's delivered by drone, <laughs> right. but that's going commercial. But as far as, a, you know, a surveillance is one thing, but murder by drone? Well, um, I should say, too, that when uh, the uh, troubles were happening in Ferguson, yes. uh, I was in touch with uh, people at the Federal Aviation Administration uh, to find out if any drones were being used at that time. My, they were, I, and I was told, no, that they, they were not. Now, you could say, were they lying or, or not? Oh, My impression that. was that this system is not, uh, of the FAA and the, uh, and the FBI, they may or may not be integrated in terms of yeah. what, what they're doing, and um, I actually, took the word of the F FAA on, on that because there wasn't any way to, you know, to challenge it. But my question is for you, why did you ask that question? I've had a lot of experience uh, technically with drones mm -hmm. and also searching uh, the internet for information mm -hmm. about contacts. Uh, I'm an activist here on the Upper West Side and we find uh, that uh, while we may win a, a lawsuit or two against Lincoln Center for, for damaging Damrush Park here, uh, there are people who object to us asking the question, why does Lincoln Center put tents, put commercial activities into a public park? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for my defense. You know, I know what lists, uh, some of the lists I'm on personally. Who else is on the list? You know, as a matter of uh, public comment, when we go to community boards, when we go to the city council, mm -hmm. uh, at that level of, of government and uh, community activity, who wants to know? And I know some of the guys who made attacks in the environmental movement against us, who are active to do better than uh, my point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, they get away with it, and they get appointed to managers of this, so managers of that, so yes. Okay, because I wanted to say that, um, I want to throw this open for people's discussion, too. I, I feel like the things that we're speaking of are not generally known by the public right. in any operable way for what should they do. One thing that I do know in speaking with people on the street here in the United States, they do not want to be watched. And they do not want to be indiscriminately uh, attacked in, in any way. Through that window, they can understand in some way what's happening with people in other countries. And so um, my question is, uh, and it's a constant question, but over the last how many ever years it is that the drone war has been going on in the Iraq war, People in the left, we have not figured out how to reach out to the public and taken that as a mission rather than something we'll do when we have time 
<laughs> to do it and finish speaking with each other about it. And um, I'm very disturbed by that because uh, I don't want to just feel happy about what I know and people I know while this thing rages on. And Kathy Kelly, I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago, uh, she's taken on civil disobedience really as just kind of, uh, this is what I do. Uh, she's been arrested four times over drones, been to jail three times, one of them for three months. I'm not saying that that's the way to educate the public, but um, what David's asking flies in the face of the fears that are being generated every single day in this country by this government and by these corporations. And I feel like, I can't say I feel like a failure, but I feel like I'm missing something here about how to go about this. I, I'd like to see what you all think about that. Alice wants to add something to this, and so do I. Yeah. You know, we, we really do have to look at the whole. It's, it's not just war. It's not just total abuse of our constitutional system that we all believe in. There is, we've been taken over. You know, the, the corporations are running the show. There's, it's like there's a huge system we have to fight, and the war system is their handmaiden, and the nuclear weapons are the tip of the spear on the, you know, in the hands of the, the conqueror. So we're not getting our message out because people, I mean, the ordinary person, the kids can get tuition, they can't go to school, they're dead. I mean, there's, you know, people are are failing, society's failing, and when and the information is like appalling. The New York Times, I I literally I think I'm gonna stop it. I think I'm gonna stop it. It didn't even report on the UN meeting. Four weeks in New York it broke up over with Israel broke it up and you know and the Arabs were up in the But the the thing is that we have to make alliances with we do have to talk about peace and justice and minimum wage and black rights and you know and like uh, what we did to indigenous. We have to like open up the whole story about how we got to where we are now because that's the only way we're going to reach those people. You know, they're they're like they're they're being manipulated by a media stream of total bullshit. I mean, you know, like constant. Big headlines are now the scandal in the soccer league. I mean, who cares? You know, that's like huge headlines. I don't know what I'm talking about. I think we can say a bit more, though, on the question of drones in U.S. skies, right? Because local police and sheriff's departments have put up huge fights for the right to have drones and weaponized drones and surveillance drones and non-lethal weaponized. Uh, drones, rubber bullets, and tear gas, and so forth. And you know, a sheriff in Texas had a press conference to show off a drone, crashed it into his armored car, proving, therefore, that he needed an armored car. Uh, there were the military. The military crashed a, a drone into a guy's backyard a couple of weeks ago. He found a drone. He showed a card with his address to the camera, and then they showed up for the drone. Uh, the FBI, between drones and airplanes and giant blimps that they're flying, the DOJ, the FBI, the flights over Baltimore, the no-fly no zone over Ferguson, they, there are flights everywhere. And, when, and the legal struggles in the legislatures of the states as they sought to restrict drones in the skies, the federal government has come in and said, we own the sky down to your shoelaces and you cannot restrict federal flights, uh, and when the ACLU has been involved in these legislative efforts, they have thrown weaponization out the window in favor of anything to deal with surveillance, right? And, and so the laws that are getting passed in those states do not restrict uh, weaponization. And the drones are being tested and flown on huge areas of the United States. They're taking over a huge chunk of Colorado for a testing area, um, and there, there are, you know, drones everywhere and there's going to be more and more of them and I think the way that we reach people who don't get it is videos right when the when the police lie but then there's a video and people watch the video and they give a damn about the person being killed uh, that has an impact well there are videos 
of the people in Yemen and everywhere else that are powerful, but they aren't on your TV, and we have to get them there. Uh, you know, so go to World Beyond War, and War is a Crime, and see you know, what we're collecting, and anything you find, spread it around, um, because it just it has an impact on people that words don't seem to. Um, I think we had someone in the front yeah, here. I, yeah. uh, I, I have a couple of questions. One, one for Amanda. Have you succinctly and in layman's terms defined what Coe's justification for targeted killing is that would make it legal? Uh, and on the broader spectrum, does, does anybody know approximately what percentage of United States private sector employment is involved in weapons development and manufacture and, and military related materials. What what percentage of, of our workforce is dependent upon killing people and making war mm -hmm. to put food on the table? Economics. So in, I can answer your first question. Um, so Harold Coe uh, articulated a couple of different rationales for the legality of targeted killing. One of them falls under the laws of war, uh, under which targeting and killing someone is lawful, but there's still restrictions that apply. So for instance, you have to be, you have to prove that you're engaged in an armed conflict. Uh, and there's a threshold uh, requirement for uh, violence that uh, arises to the level of being in an armed conflict. Um, you also have to, if you're targeting someone who is a civilian, prove that they were directly participating in hostilities. Um, you also have to still abide by uh, principles of necessity, distinction, proportionality, and humanity. And so, for instance, targeting uh, a community gathering where 40 people are, are present in order to target one alleged uh, militant who you think might, who be, you think might be, you know, violates all of those. Um, it's not proportional. You can't you know, it can't show that it's necessary. And is it's that not through humane. The, is that through the FISA courts? Not through the FISA courts. So international humanitarian law operates through. So it's rooted in the Geneva Conventions. And so, for instance, um, violations of the laws of war, for instance, would have to be, uh, you'd have to get, like, there would be the Red Cross that would be involved, the United Nations Security Council, even after a strike, for instance, that occurs in uh, alleged compliance with the laws of war, there still has to be reporting to the Security Council on the circumstances of that strike, and that reporting has never happened uh, by the U.S. government. So it totally fails its transparency and accountability obligations under the laws of war, which does permit killing in certain circumstances. And then there's human rights law, which you know even further limits a state's ability to target and kill someone. Um, and there, I mean, you have to show that it's, you know, it's necessary to um, address an imminent threat to life or to one's bodily integrity. And so, you know, to say that, um, yeah, the, the killing of Anwar al laki was in response, to, was legitimate self-defense, um, is highly specious. Um, Let's be clear, that the, once you get into this laws of war nonsense, excuse me, yeah, uh, no, you have to first ignore the existence of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which bans war, the UN Charter, which bans all of these wars, because none of them meet the narrow exceptions that are in the UN Charter, uh, the national based laws on war like the U.S. Constitution and the War Powers Resolution. You have to take a principled stand that all such laws banning war must be ignored, as Human Rights Watch does, as Amnesty International does, and just pretend that the wars are legal. And then you get into the question of, is this particular piece of this war legal? And let's be clear, before 2001, the United States government position on going into a country and killing somebody, as Israel did and advocated doing, was that it was blatantly illegal. Across the board, black and white, illegal, reprehensible, to be denounced. And once the United States started doing it, they stopped saying that, but nothing changed in any written law. Right? And, and so all of these sort of vague ideas of proportion and justification and, and the, the laws of war, I mean, it's all in the eye of the beholder. There's nothing empirical or scientific about it. Right? And so it, it, there's just been this acceptance that it's okay to go murder people. And we've had law professors like uh, Rosa Brooks and others go into Congress and say, 
if going and murdering that person in, in Somalia was part of a war, then it's okay. But if it wasn't, then, well, it's obviously murder. Is it part of a war or not? I don't know, because the president has a secret memo explaining whether or not it's part of a war, and he won't show it to us. He's a law professor. What does she think a law is? <laughs> and, so th and so this law professor, whose mother, by the way, is, what, is a hero of, of anti-war writing and understanding, uh, but uh, th this law professor has arrived at uh, Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, whose daughter is a you know is this so-called law professor. She's the, the the daughter has arrived at the position now that you should eliminate the distinction between wartime and peacetime and just have wartime, right? Wow. And again, this once you follow the logic that war does not look like it did in the 19th century, that it's not on a battlefield, that it's not two teams with different colored jerseys, that it's in people's homes and villages, and it's slaughter primarily of civilians. I mean, once you recognize the reality of war and drop the rhetoric and the, and the language of battle space and so forth, well, then you have to logically either be for the acceptance of murdering anybody or the acceptance of murdering nobody. And there's this entire field of so-called humanitarian law that deals with making distinctions that cannot be made, uh, in my ignorant opinion, never having gone to law school. Yeah, no, uh, that's exactly right. Well, I think it's important yeah, to know justified. that Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch will not condemn drone warfare. Mm -hmm. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch will not condemn drone warfare and say it has to stop. It's a very important to understand that that is a huge reality out there that most people are not aware of, and it's premised on this kind of legal shenanigans and that you're pointing out, and if you look at the Board of Trustees of New York University, you will see people who are deeply, deeply involved in a system of finance and war that the law professors are very, very conscious of. And so these things are not independent, you know, free thinking university things. And what Amanda is saying, in my opinion, is thoroughgoing throughout the university systems of the United States. And there's this woman, Mary Ellen O'Connell, uh, who's a very, uh, I think caring person, but it's taken her at least three years to move toward the notion that the whole damn thing is elite. Toward it, toward it, yeah. <laughs> because she hasn't gotten to that point yet, and she started out even more narrowly justifying, you know, or, or condemning, and now it's become more and more and more. She's down at Princeton working on her sabbatical and this and that. So when you're in this environment and you do what Amanda is, that's more than being a skunk at the lawn party. That is, no, you're out. You are definitely, and, and incidentally, don't try to be a lawyer anywhere in this country. <laughs> We've got a bunch more questions, but the second question you had, I don't think we're able to answer, but just to note that it is a very good question. It is a question that would be very difficult, and this is what percentage of people are involved in the, in the, in the military industry. Uh, I get a book by, by uh, Nick Terse called The Complex, the, this, 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 the 25 different things complex, because, uh, I mean, he tries to find somewhere to buy a cup of coffee that's not a military contractor, and of course Starbucks is at Guantanamo and so forth. But once you get into who's a subcontractor, who's got money coming, it's every university, it's every store, it's every industry. Uh, I mean, it's hard to find anywhere to buy anything that's not a subcontractor of a subcontractor mm -hmm. of the military. Uh, which is not to say that the Starbucks, you know, on the corner here is engaged in killing people. Uh, it's just that you would have to, there's a million different ways you could slice it where to stop who's part of the machine. Uh, and, but it would be an incredibly valuable thing uh, to find somebody who's, who could research it and come up with, with a good answer. Um, okay, in the second row and then in the first row. You had mentioned that we talk to each other and then any of us don't do anything or the issue with the drones. But I'm very concerned about this militarization which permeates the society, but permeates the high schools and our kids. Mm -hmm. 
you talked about tapes and videos to bring out the message. These kids watch these military videos all the time, and, and toys as, as a game, war as a game, the games they the toys they're able to play with. And I feel the message has to be brought down to youth. And nothing like this is discussed in schools. They don't have social studies, which has uh, conflict resolution, or the truth about wars, or what is, what is law about. And the, the issues that they can start earlier with to understand better and perhaps have a political action club, which some schools do, but so few. And with the new Common Core, forget about it. But the militarization of youth is a key because they grow up. And when the military is in the schools, as they are in JROTC and many other ways, their aim is to win the hearts and minds of children. And how do we win the hearts and minds of children so that they think in another form? But with games and videos and movies, it's beyond us. I mean, the military, industrial, entertainment, education complex is bigger than we think, and it's uh, probably in John Jay as well. So um, how do you bring your message, um, Nick, or anyone, to the schools? I know we've tried. I've been with Nick, and he's amazing. When you bring a drone in the street, people relate. They see it and they think about it and they understand it. Weaponize is a little tricky because of what you've said, they feel we're in danger. But surveillance drones, nobody wants. And um, in the streets makes a difference, in the schools, I hope and, and think would make a difference. We have to think of the future of a grandmother, you know. I'll answer any question whether I know anything or not, but maybe one of you. <laughs> well, I, I would just say very briefly, I was uh, invited to go to career day at a, uh, Castle Hill Middle School in the Bronx. Uh, I was there. My alma mater. And I was there last year, and I, and I spoke about drones and about how it related to my work as a reporter and this and that. And the students were very interested in some of, in some of these things about war and, a, and, a, and about a perspective, but I asked a, one class a question, how many uh, people here have heard the word colonialism? And there wasn't one child who raised their hand. Now, I feel as we tried to get a group started to work with the schools uh, last year and it just fell apart. Um, but I totally, I totally agree with that because the children do go and, and speak with their uh, families, you know, and they go home and say, well, I saw this and this and, and that. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's a, it's a, and the kids are very enthusiastic. See, that age is good. You know, they're not thinking about romance and what, da, 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 da. you know, they're really like, gee, I'm curious, you know. Well, when I was at a career fair day with the peace action table, um, the first three tables in the cafeteria were Army, Navy, Marines. Wow. All they give to give out. So if they give you a water bottle, you sign your name, address, and phone number so they immediately have contact information. They're in their uniforms. The children's minds are prepared to accept that. It's very glamorous. They came to the peace table. They were interested, and we had activities to better understand and other options. But the Army, Navy, and Marines still well, there, you know, there are groups uh, doing wonderful counter-recruitment work at those tables, uh, <laughs> like you, uh, but all over the country, and there are people who will go and speak in high schools and colleges, and we will go and speak in any school that will have us, let us know, and we will go and speak there. And there are wonderful books that can be gotten into these schools, and there are projects working on improving or preventing the worsening of the history books that are in the schools. And uh, I mean, we're trying to facilitate that work at World Beyond War because it is among the most important uh, places we can work. Did you have a question? Hi, Brian O'Hare. I'm happy to be here tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, I uh, live on Long Island with the Suffolk Peace Network. And uh, recently on Long Island was the Jones Beach Air Show. It takes place every year. The Blue Angels, the, and, and the whole thing is a weekend glorification of war. And Pax Christie and Veterans for Peace have a section where uh, they go and have ribbons for the deceased and uh, the war, uh, and, and try to bring the message of peace. And, and generally, 
the Bench of Peace say this is Memorial Day. We're supposed to be remembering those who died in war and not glorifying the military hardware. And it's a big barbecue for Long Island. A lot of people have got a Facebook page, boycott the Jones Beach Air Show. You know, we've been doing this for years. But you talk about the permeation and the culture of the militarism and even the amusement. Oh, look at the amazing tricks. Look at all the smoke. Look at this. Look at that. It's patriotic. And it's it just becomes like this. You, you, Alice said, we've been taken over. We have been yeah. taken over in here. We've been taken over in, in, in physical reality. What percentage work for the military in some capacity? 100. 100 percent. Somehow we're all, <laughs> somehow it's just 100. We're all connected so deeply through this. You know, we couldn't get a professor to oppose this guy. I mean, it's so, you know, it's so vast and, uh, you know, overwhelming uh, in its, uh, you know, structure. Um, and, uh, you know, so I'm, uh, I'm really glad to be here and, uh, uh, you know, listen to, you know, same uh, analysis of it. It is a drunken uncle stabbing people in the house, and we are uh, going through this, uh, you know, looking back at what's taking place in the, you know, I'm, I'm 50, going to be 58, so I uh, remember, you know, Vietnam and the, the protests and, and, the, and the spirit of peace kind of coming, like, into pop, you want to call it pop culture, just so many people reporting uh, you know, the death, you know, 50 more U.S. guys died this week, 60 more in neighborhoods, it just throughout, you know. So it's like, it is more that, you know, like, uh, you know, it's not happening right here. And I look at the, you know, it, things happen in the, in the culture. I look at the drones sort of like the machine gun being created. You know, like the, when that happened in World War I, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they could kill faster and furious you know, like my favorite book of all time is All Quiet on the Western Front in the movie also. That to me is, the, they never surpassed it in terms of de demonstrating, you know, the horror and insanity of war. You know, um, that, uh, you know, and David really appreciate all your work and writings over the years and, uh, you know, it, it, it is really troublesome. Uh, I, I just uh, feel so, you know, like, uh, impassioned. Uh, and peace, how do we bring peace, the message of peace. I went to a video game store, my daughter, you know, five, six, I said, do you have a game called Peaceful Discussion? It's just, you know, uh, so, you know, like, pervasive. I'm sorry. I want to comment. This is why I love World Beyond War. I am, like, so stuck with the idea that we can make the end of war on the planet and I do whose time has come just by speaking about it, yeah. just by talking about the solutions and the myths, and I mean like getting millions of people to speak about it, like one to one to one and enrolling people in the idea that we're not stuck with this, it is possible. You know, we ended slavery, we, you know, we uh, liberated women so we can also end war on it. Like, all part of this bad system, and I think we sh this should be like a conversation if all of us go out and talk to 10 people and enroll them and enroll me on war and ask them to enroll 10 people. We did that with the Hunger Project in 1976 when everybody said hunger was inevitable, people always starve. We said, no, you can make the end of hunger on the planet. And I do this time has come. And although we haven't ended hunger, it's been cut in half. There's millennium development goals for ending hunger. Nobody even talks about ending hunger. Now everybody's talking about it. I mean, this sounds spacey, but this is how it's going to happen. By, by talking about it's possible, we have solutions, we know how to do it, we have this book of ideas how you can do it. You know, it's not going to be done by the book. It's going to be done when everybody keeps talking about and pointing to the things that are working. Mm -hmm. And I, I just I just hope we'll all be part of this army going out to make this an idea this time. And there are peace tapes. There are peace armies? video <laughs> right. games. Yeah, we have to I want to kill language. for Christ. <laughs> there, there you are, go. Oh, I feel better now. <laughs> I got it. There are peace board games. There are peace video games. There are peace films. There are, you can yeah. get a, a list of the good games and take them to the store us. and require that the store start carrying them, right? And there's a middle school teacher with a world peace game going all around the world teaching schools. 
how to play the World Peace Game in school. You can watch his TED talk, just search for World Peace Game. Uh, there were, they said the party set up outside of Philadelphia a video game expo store where they would recruit you know, teenagers and younger uh, into the military by letting them play the video games where they're shooting a real gun at a screen, you know, and the protesters shut it down. Uh, they, uh, th there was like a weapons festival in Chicago that uh, I think they successfully stopped that Kathy Kelly wrote a about a friend of hers working on in an introduction to one of my books. Uh, so, and even until you stop the weapons uh, air show, every time you're there with signs and information, you're influencing people uh, who are going to remember that message, even if it takes them 20 years to hear it. Um, but the, the, the problem is that mass murder in this culture has been made acceptable. Uh, I mean, the Washington Post had an op-ed some weeks back, maybe war on Iran is the best option. Right? They would never say maybe child abuse is the best option, maybe racism is the best option, maybe hurt, hurting kittens is the best option. There, there are things that you cannot say. They are unacceptable. They would be scandalous. Right? Uh, I heard an arms dealer on NPR uh, joking about if the occupation of Afghanistan ends, I, I hope this was around 2011, I really hope we can have a big, long occupation of Libya, he, 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 ha, 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 we'll be kidding. But he wasn't kidding. And if it had been a joke about, uh, you know, I hope we can have uh, slavery like Obama seems to want to insist on in Malaysia now, or I, I hope we can have uh, racism, or I hope we can have child abuse. I mean, there are things that you can't joke about because they're understood to be unacceptable. So we have to put mass murder into that category somehow. Well, Nebraska did it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go one, two, and then back to this side. Thanks. Um, can you elaborate on the connection between climate change and poverty and war? Well, it's possible to go on a huge length on this, and the World Beyond War website does, and I think Nick can as well. But the, the well, war, the question change. is connections between war, climate, climate poverty. chaos, and poverty. Um, well, you know, the, the, the world is spending some $9 trillion or so a year on war and related violence, uh, about $2 trillion on militarism from the 200 countries. Well, some countries don't do it. Costa Rica, Iceland, lots of little countries don't do it. And Costa Rica at the moment is doing purely renewable energy and is always at the top in the happiness rankings and so forth. And these things are not coincidental. Uh, you look at the countries that are doing well in education, in environmental sustainability, in happiness and job security and, and so forth, and they are the countries that are not spending. I mean, of course, most countries are spending less than 5% what the United States is. I mean, the evil Iran, less than 1% what the United States is on militarism. Uh, and the, the big difference, other than the billionaires in the United States, is the war industry. Uh, and it is the number one creator of environmental disaster sites and so-called Superfund sites in the United States. Uh, it is the number one poisoner of air, land, and water in the United States and outside of it. The number one destroyer of islands uh, in uh, islands like Vieques off Puerto Rico, islands in Asia. They're now taking new islands for Navy bombing in the Marianas. Uh, the number one evictor of whole societies in, uh, in Greenland and Diego Garcia and so forth I means the most destructive force we have. Uh, and it's the testing, it's the, it, it's the what's left over. I mean, huge areas of Iraq just poisoned. Uh, the birth defect epidemics, the cancer, uh, Afghanistan, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the forest's gone, the birds don't go to Afghanistan anymore. I mean, the environmental destruction uh, is enormous, uh, and you wouldn't know about it to look at the environmental activist groups. Uh, well, I'd like to add note the enormous use of fossil fuels and extractive, extractive uh, policies going towards military, all the military stuff. And the waste of it, IQ points, all the intellectual resources going into well, that. I think there's another part of it, that I, I, and, I, and I like your question because I think it, it demonstrates that these connections have not been well made by us, okay, who are, who are concerned about it. 
uh, weapons. There's another aspect to this that I think is very important. If you look at uh, the price of oil in the world and the control over uh, a certain number of a, a volume of pumping oil is necessary to, to sustain prices and the manipulation of pumping is necessary to the manipulate, which is happening now, actually. Um, you look at those countries that control the, the vast critical amounts of pumping. Most of them are countries that are very, very poor, where the military, with the help of the United States, is used to impose the control over the vast majority of people to let that pumping occur. What happened in Iraq when Saddam, uh, when Saddam Hussein took over was that the oil of Iraq came under the control of the government, not the oil companies, because the oil companies had been pumping at their will to sustain prices or not. The Iraqi says, that's undependable for us. We can't have it. We have to control it ourselves. And that's one of the things that led to the invasion of Iraq, to get that out of the control of the people who would have kept more of it in the ground, thinking, well, maybe you know, 10 years from now, we'll want to sustain our, our economy with this oil. So that's how military and poverty are connected into oil. Same, same with Libya. Iran. It's how can we, the sort of international climate change um, movement, against climate change um, connect with the anti-war movement? I mean, there, there I are wish a couple I could of, answer that one. But we've got to be very quick, and then we'll take whatever questions are left, and we'll try to all answer them quickly, because we're going to run out of time. But uh, That's a obviously, question. the resources that could transform our economies into sustainable, renewable energy economies are sitting there in the military spending, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, that money has to move from the most destructive force to the most constructive place in terms of protecting the environment. And the military is the number one destroyer of the environment uh, in wars that are fought for the fuels that will be used to kill us all if the wars don't kill us first. Uh, but the, the United States is the top militarist and the top nation for poverty among industrialized nations, not by coincidence. And the amount of money that it would take to end world poverty, which is absolutely unnecessary, is far less than what the United States is spending making itself hated with the militarism. Um, let, let's see, how, anybody else still have a question? Yeah. Okay, let's get one more question and then have uh, remarks from everybody up here and then we'll break up. Okay, uh, well, for, first, thank you guys. I mean, I think I'm speaking for everyone in the room when I say that uh, this has been a wonderful panel. So many times at the left forum you go to panels, it seems to consist of people competing to be more obscure, where you guys were, 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 were concrete and, and, and understandable. Uh, and and you know, every one of you was just smart. Nice. Uh, yeah. and, and Nick, Nick, I have a, a question for you about uh, uh, future of drones. Drone technology doesn't seem all that mysterious to any of us who flew model airplanes as a kid. I mean, it doesn't seem that this thing seems more miraculous to me than a, than a drone. So, so the question is, how, how long will it be before the Crips and the Bloods have drones? Before they're in the general population and people can blow up their neighbor's house because right now they can take pictures of weddings from a drone. So how much harder would it be to uh, attack, uh, attach a bomb to it? And is that it, what's being is that being addressed? I would I would say that um, the control of uh, Congress and the legislatures by corporations who want to have a free reign are going to prevent any real legislative examination of what needs to be done to con to control that. I think the response is most under the environment fear that we have right now in this country is to equip the police with more drones so they can attack the Crips and the Bloods. Yes. They can, they, the people can, you know, in, in Colorado there was a group that said, well, 
we're going to sanction the shooting down of drones by the general public because we, we want to protect our privacy. <laughs> the, 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 the mentality in this country right now is, is so anarchistic. Would we argue violence. that the right to bear arms includes drones? Yeah, yes, and, I, and, I, and so I, I am not at all optimistic about that, given the, the overall militaristic climate. And, the, and, the, and the, these, the, the, these bikers went and they just started killing people down in Texas. In a certain way, they're kind of like romantic heroes. Now, I will say that if a group of black people had gone into that parking lot and started to systematically shoot people, there would have been a bloodbath in the black community down there. But these guys have this macho, white, supremacist, gangster system that has really gone unchallenged. Uh, this drone operator, I said he was going to be court-martialed, methamphetamine. It said in the newspaper that he was connected with the Vegas motorcycle gang right up out of Mexico and in the Southwest. And we didn't even hear about these criminals until this thing happened. If this were a black group of people on motorcycles doing this shit, carrying guns around all the time, excuse me. Amanda, do you have any final comments? Well, so, you know, so just in thinking about, you know, moving forward, I think for me, you know, the process of being involved in, you know, the anti Harold Coe campaign has been, while difficult, also uh, has helped me develop and hold on to the sense of hope in terms of exposing me to a community of people who are fighting for war, uh, war to end, who are pushing for peace, who are combating uh, drones within their own spheres and also more broadly. Um, and, and so, you know, for me, it, um, yeah, it does actually encourage me being here and being connected to a broader community of people who can imagine ways to tackle problems that sometimes in isolation by myself feel so overwhelming. So thank you all uh, for everything that you guys do, for you yeah. all's work as well. Um, it's very encouraging. And Alice, anything else to say? Um, I just, I think we just have to keep on keeping on. I think, I think it's getting so bad it's going to get good. Right? Just like, like even ordinary people are seeing that, you know, something is amiss. And I think we have to get political. Being here in New York City, we have a great mayor. The head of our city council marched in the, of our environmental committee, marched with the 400,000 people that turned out in New York on the climate, and he lives in Far Rockaway that was underwater, so they get it. And then, like, they, they put in a resolution out to shut down Indian Point, which is our own Fukushima up the Hudson. That's right. You should call your council people and, and let's have some victories. Let's let's get Do let's something. support De Blasio. He wants to fix housing and rent control and Cuomo's giving him a hard time with this lousy privatization, you know, going I'm speaking as a New Yorker now. But I think <laughs> that to me it's now it's local. Act local, think global. We have such an opportunity right now in New York. I've never felt more the power of this new council with the new mayor, and we should get active. Well, act local and act global, and it's right. not going to get better unless we do. <laughs> and it, and it, it is going to be common wisdom that James Madison meant the Second Amendment to include drones on let, which is going to be <laughs> no more absurd than having a war on terror, no more absurd than targeted killings. It is, people, this country has gone insane in the past decade, and people are incited and don't see it. And you, we've got to step outside of that and understand that we have to turn it around a different way, um, which of course we can. It's been done many times in the past. So get to work or stay here. we got another panel coming up. <laughs>